Welcome. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. We're so excited uh, to have this workshop today with Anuria um, uh, on how uh, mental health plays a vital role in menstrual health. Um, this workshop is presented by the Period Junction. The Period Junction is an initiative by Aurorgia Seva, um, which strives to unite menstrual health stakeholders by creating a space where experiences in the field, um, best practices, knowledge, and capacity building opportunities are shared to propel um, both individual and collective menstrual health initiatives. Uh, the Peer Junction currently resides via a WhatsApp group and has plans to expand in the near future. Arogya Seva is a nonprofit organization um, that uh, is a micro-volunteering platform with a mission to provide equitable access to healthcare for all at a little or no cost. Today, I'd like to welcome Anuya Kurapati to facilitate our workshop on how mental health plays a vital role in menstrual health. Um, thank you so much for offering us your time, Anuya. Anuya Kuropati is a JRF doctoral fellow at Christ University, Bengaluru, who received her MSc in health economics from the University of York. She is the founder of Beyond Blood, which is an organization that initiated an inclusive menstrual mental health movement to spotlight PMDD and PME. Her current research focuses on medical gaslighting, benevolent sexism, and mental health seeking behavior of women and girls under the backdrop of the Indian health system. Thank you so much. I will hand it off to you, Anuya. Take it away. Thank you so much. Um, before I start, I do want to ask if anyone has any questions or anything that they would like for me to discuss so I can sort of um, structure the entire conversation around it. You can just drop the questions in the chat box if you have. I'll just give it like a minute or two. All right. Um, while that happens, I'm just going to say how I'm going to be talking about and what I'm going to be talking about um, today in this one hour. I'll essentially be talking about how intertwined is menstruation and mental health and how broad they are and what essentially that we focus on that is PMDD and PME. And I'll also give a little more details about how to identify and differentiate between PMDD, PMS and PME and what are the treatments that are available and how other people can be supportive to someone who might have PMDD or PME. Does it sound good? I hope it does. So when we first started out um, trying to understand what should ascertain a menstrual mental health movement, we realized that the scope is really, really broad because every single aspect of uh, menstrual disorders, endocrine disorders, reproductive disorders, as well as premenstrual disorders are really intertwined with mental health aspect of it. Uh, some of the examples I'd say is some menstrual disorders would be in terms of uh, menstrual pain, really uh, high pain, that is primary dysmenorrhea, secondary dys dysmenorrhea, are intertwined with. Yeah, can I don't yeah, know? I've muted them. You can continue. Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, so someone who have high uh, menstrual pain can also experience anxiety. They also are more prone to depression. So this is how when it comes to menstrual health disorders that you're directly related to mental health. Now let's talk about endocrine disorders like let's say PCOS or thyroid. They also have studies show that they're also related to mental health because of how insulin receptors intersect with neurotransmitters that are responsible for someone to be happy, that's what we call it. And premenstrual disorders, which essentially are, the, are directly related to mental health, that would be PMS, PMDD, and PME. Then we have the reproductive disorders, which are the uterine fibroids, endometriosis, adenomyosis, ovarian cysts. Now, all of these disorders directly cause pain, and they also have a high impact on neurotransmitters because when it comes to menstruators, the way that estrogen and progesterone interact with neurotransmitters is really, really complicated because of which trying to understand how menstruation and mental health are related to each other becomes very complex because it's not as 
equal i would say as understanding what happens in a male body and how it testosterone influences mental health now apart from this we also have menopause and mental health because we all know how lack of estrogen itself again becomes responsible for depression responsible for body image issues and things of that sort that directly relate to again menopause and mental health then we have pregnancy and post pregnancy and how it's related to mental health now all of this come actually under the purview of menstruation and mental health and it's really really broad one of the things that we really need to understand is that when we talk about menstruation and mental health it's not something new that has just come up because it can we can date back to the early 1900 1900s where menstrual psychology was actually one of the subdivisions or sub branches of psychology but it never really took off because of sexism and misogyny that exists not only in academic circles but also how the second wave feminism took to it as well now since P- since beyond blood specifically focuses on premenstrual disorders i'll move into a little bit details about the pms pmdd and pme uh, before that i do want to kind of stress on the abbreviations of them pms is premenstrual syndrome pmdd is premenstrual dysphoric disorder and pme is premenstrual exasperation um it's actually really interesting to see how pmdd in itself has developed throughout the ages from dsm dsm is essentially used to sort of diagnose the mental health conditions now premenstrual dysphoric disorder is no longer considered as a specific mental health disorder it is considered as a mood disorder that has implications to gynecology because of which it was included in icd which is international classification of diseases now this was a really huge thing because in dsm is only used by psychiatrists or psychologists but when it comes to icd every other doctor every other health professional can use it making it easier to diagnose people who have pmdd this happened really recently and when i say really recently it happened in 2019 um and that was a very great landmark in trying to raise awareness and also creating legitimacy of pmdd in itself now we all experience pms like when i say pms i think some everyone has some clue of what it is there is breast tenderness there is irritability um forgetfulness probably like body pains cramps and even you know your skin feeling a little bit duller uh, excessive bloating all of these things but when does pms really become pmdd is the question that we need to ask ourselves is that how severe is severe and how do we know that we have pmdd now if all of these pms symptoms are seriously affecting your life that is your ability to maintain relationships ability to get out of bed to get things done is affecting your work negatively it's it's having a huge impact on your socio economic aspects then it's usually considered as pmdd and in order to be diagnosed with pmdd one needs to have these symptoms for more than 3 to 6 months you need to experience these symptoms for a prolonged period of time to be diagnosed with pmdd now why is pmdd or awareness about pmdd is important because 30% of people who have pmdd will commit an act of suicide and i know that using commit is not technically right but that's how it's put across everywhere now 30% is a really really high number now you take those statistics and then cross reference and see the number of suicides that happen in reproductive age among women in india you would be surprised to see, and you'd probably ask yourself is there really a relation between this and pmdd um one of the things that we need to remember about the difference between pms and pmdd is that most of the time people will say pmdd is a severe form of pms but that is not true it is colloquially true because that's how i'm trying to explain it and that's how everyone's trying to say that it is a severe form but there's actually two distinct and separate disorders now the cause of pms is just a uh, regular cyclical changes but the cause of pmdd is that there's a cellular reaction to 
everyday change in hormones that people experience across their cycle. That means your brain is literally having an allergic reaction to the everyday change in hormones that is estrogen and progesterone. It changes throughout your cycle, right? So literally your brain is having an allergic reaction. That is exactly what causes PMDD. There is actually a genetic reason for it. And um, more research is going to try to find out how to find this genetic abnormality in order to diagnose women at a quicker or a faster rate. And interestingly enough, PMDD was often used uh, before as a reason. It was actually used as a reason to justify murder in the 1900s. So because of which the entire disease itself was riddled with stigma. And um, th that's why there is a lot of, I would say, hesitation, even among feminists, even feminist psychologists and psychiatrists to talk about a PMDD in a normal way because they think we are trying to sort of pathologize women's physiology. But we is actually needing help. More often than not, PMDD is usually misdiagnosed as bipolar. And that actually makes things worse because the bipolar medication doesn't really necessarily work for people who have PMDD. Why does PMDD often get diagnosed as bipolar? Because people will have depression during their premenstrual phase and they'll have more positivity and more maniac exp uh, expressions Because of this, it's often considered as bipolar because you're expressing maniac and depression episodes in continuous way. But having right knowledge is really important to be able to diagnose PMDD. And by right knowledge, I mean trying to map out these manic and depression episodes based on your menstrual cycle. Now, the other thing apart from PMS and PMDD that we have is premenstrual pre exaberration. What is this? Is here, what happens is your underlying disorders like depression, anxiety, they become worse or they, the symptoms become worse in the premenstrual phase. That happens because premenstrually, we do produce very less serotonin. And because of this, the existing mental health disorders can become worse. So now that is what, it's not just for mental health, it's also for physical health. Premenstrual exaboration also comes when migraines get really worse premenstrually. It can also be joint pains or arthritis. Any existing disorders that become worse premenstrually, it's called as premenstrual exaboration. It can be both physical or mental, but currently there's more research in terms of mental health more than physical health. And I'll go a little bit into uh, PMDD symptoms and how the origins of it all. Initially it was called as late luteal phase dysphoric disorder because it usually happened in the late luteal phase. That is a uh, one week or two weeks before your period that's called the luteal phase. Then they changed it to premenstrual phase dysphoric disorder and then finally landed at PMDD. And the first ever time PMDD was mentioned was in 1987. And we are in 2019 and less than 2% 2 of the entire population that suffers from PMDD is diagnosed as of now, less than 2%. And we have been in India, we have been trying to find doctors who are knowledgeable about PMDD. And more often than not, when we do find them, these are the doctors who have graduated or who have studied abroad. So what we're trying to see here is that it's a pattern where PMDD is completely not there in any textbook. Either it is students who are studying postgraduate psychology or any psychiatrist, as well as medical doctors. And obviously, sometimes I feel like we pay so much of importance on gynecologists. Like every single time people are like, let's go to gynecologists. I mean, gynecologists are not an answer for everything. You need to understand there's so many more doctors. You have PCOS, go to a reproductive endocrinologist, go to an endocrinologist. The gynecologist 
might be able to help you but whose speciality is it really when it comes to women's health or menstruators health why are we only trying to run to a gynecologist is a question that we need to ask ourselves as well because we are in this activism space and this is an other phase of where you know you experience this medical gaslighting where you go to doctors and then you hear them say that uh, it's it's probably like you have low you know low pain threshold or you're just feeling it it's all in your head but the thing is it's literally in your head right um now let let me go into a little bit technical terms as to understanding what exactly goes into understanding pmdd is that there is a specific gene called esr1 gene now in this specific gene people pmdd have a variation in this gene because of which they are very sensitive to everyday raise and you know everyday rise and fall in estrogen and progesterone another thing i always want to stress is pmdd is not related to hormonal imbalance at all pmdd and hormonal imbalance do not go in together you might have hormonal imbalance that is not related to pmdd but in order to have pmdd you don't necessarily have to have hormonal imbalance like i said before and i'm repeating myself again is that the natural rise and fall in estrogen and progesterone that one observes throughout their cycle is what causes this sort of reaction or response to pmdd like i said before it was considered as mental health disorder and it's no longer considered as mental health disorder and another thing that uh, that is really important uh, evidence into understanding why we need not just a uh, regular response but also crisis response to pmdd is because of the suicidal ideation so when we talk about suicidal ideation we have two types of suicidal ideation passive suicidal ideation and active suicidal ideation when it comes to pmdd most of the women are at passive suicidal ideation and i'm saying women because the studies have only been conducted on cisgender women and did not include afabs and when it comes to passive suicidal ideation you're just thinking about a plan or you're just wanting to kill yourself but you don't really have a very strong plan in place but when it comes to active suicidal and you have begun to put that plan into action and a lot of studies have shown a clear correlation between the premenstrual phase and suicidal ideation because it's recurring and it's also persistent and these distressing thoughts for some people can be a voice in their head telling them to kill themselves or disturbing images of watching themselves um, kill themselves things of this sort and apart from this the other things with pmdd that pushes or that increases suicidal ideation is because there's a clear association between pmdd and alcohol abuse there's also very great association between pmdd and risky sexual be- behavior now all of these things increases the likelihood of uh, elevating or increasing someone's suicidal ideations or thoughts and because of how estrogen interacts with other neurotransmitters it becomes really complex to understand exactly which neurotransmitters and how and what is causing this sort of response when it comes to suicidal ideation and pmdd but because the research only has begun recently we would have to wait a few more years to clearly understand how it's are interacting with estrogen and progesterone for people who have pmdd and this is why crisis response is really important when it comes to suicidal ideation because it doesn't really take a lot of time to turn a passive suicidal ideation into an active suicidal ideation and because of the less time that it takes between turning the active suicidal ideation into passive suicidal ideation someone needs to have crisis support they need to have a plan of action they need to have a safety plan in place so that they can just wait for the pmdd phase to pa- pass and just get more clarity 
a lot of survivors who of pmdd suicidal actions do regret making that plan or even acting upon the suicidal tendencies and thoughts because that's i think this is where the complexities really increase because of how complex the pmdd in itself is even though sometimes you do know okay i'm going to get my pmdd week i'm going to experience it so i have to be more careful i have to you know indulge in self care or this is my safety plan but sometimes this sort of disassociation that happens between the person you are as somebody who has pmdd during the pmdd week versus person you are after your pmdd week and this disassociation is what really causes people to act on ir- irrational thoughts including suicidal ideation now at beyond let what we ideally do is we do provide uh, making safety plans we do provide crisis support uh, crisis support is directly handled by the mental health professionals where the peer support is handled by other people who have pmdd because uh, peer counseling has been very effective in other mental health disorders so we thought why not for pmdd now apart from all of this there are a lot of jokes about pms okay she's just pmsing oh it's just funny or i don't know she's irritating or like you know you you walk into i don't know your friend or your girlfriend or your partner and then you just find them uh angry and you're like what did you get your periods or some really bad menstrual humor about this and i think this sort of stigma that is associated with that idea of crazy women or women going crazy because of periods is really what stops women from taking or seeking the healthcare behavior and also the medical gaslighting or lack of knowledge is also coming from the doctors and how the society or people in general make fun of pms or their experiences these really act upon uh, someone's idea of seeking healthcare behavior seeking help and i think when we really try to act on it and change that only can we really go further towards talking about it diagnosing it and treating it when it comes to treating pmdd there are various courses of actions one of the first things that people do is take oral contraceptive pills and why do they do that is because if your menstrual cycle itself is not present if you're not ovulating because um usually people with pmdd uh, start responding or start getting symptoms after they finish their ovulation then you're ideally not going to experience this natural rise and fall in estrogen and progesterone because of which you're safe from experiencing the pmdd symptoms but some people with pmdd are very progesterone sensitive generally progesterone has a calming effect on people but when it comes to pmdd some people with pmdd have very high sensitivity to progesterone which causes them to have a worsening of their symptoms so the oral contraceptive pills will not work if, especially if they're on a combination pill and after that they move on to antidepressants and within antidepressants also there are various classifications and most of the time people use sertraline and this antidepressant is initially given for all 30 days and later depending upon the conversations and what the doctor feels is right you move on to taking it only before uh, 14 days of your uh, period and even sometimes what happens is the treatment works for a while and then it sort of stops working and we really don't have enough information to understand why that happens so then people have their last stage of treatment which is either chemical menopause or surgical menopause now chemical menopause is usually when you take medications and chemically induce menopause in a way that your ovaries are not functioning one of the reasons why people take or go for chemical menopause is because they want to have children at a later time uh, but for now they they want to get um relief from pmdd and in some cases women do go for surgical menopause even though a lot of times surgical menopause does help surgical menopause includes not just taking out the ovaries but also the, um, the uterus so it's a complete hysterectomy um now it does help a lot of women 
do feel like having a full hysterectomy helps them with their PMDD and they lose their all the PMDD symptoms because they're essentially in menopause. But what happens is that menopause itself comes with its own drawbacks. And studies show that people who have PMDD are prone to higher depression when they enter menopause. Now, this is also another reason to take into all existing research, look into every single thing there is, talk to a qualified doctor who has the right information before choosing to take a drastic step that might not be reversible. But some people also experience something called as phantom cycles. They might be under menopause, but psychologically they're experiencing phantom cycles because of which they experience PMDD. Again, it's very complex. I'm not sure how many of you have heard of phantom pregnancies. Now, in terms of phantom pregnancies, the person is not actually pregnant. They do not have a viable pregnancy or a fetus or anything, but they do experience all pregnancy symptoms, including uh, the expansion of the uterus. But they're not ideally pregnant at all. So this is also similar to how somebody experienced phantom cycles. They do not have the uh, in actual biological response or the ovaries that actually are producing this estrogen and progesterone, but they're somehow mimicking the cycle because of which the PMDD becomes worse. Now, these people usually require very high, higher doses of um, medication to help them with this. Uh, we do have certain people in India who whose PMDD has progressed to a really bad stage that their psychiatrist decided to give them sedatives. Even though it's not considered a plan for PMDD especially, um, this particular person was put on sedatives because of um, what their psychiatrist felt was right. And a lot of times women don't, women and people generally, they think, okay, my doctor said that I need to do this, so I have to do this. We don't really realize that as patients, we have right. We have right to choose a treatment. In fact, you can even refuse a life-saving treatment if you don't want to do it. We do have patient rights. And that's the ethics of it is that full consent in un understanding your treatment, full consent in choosing your treatment, whether you, but again, because it has so many psychological symptoms, the agency and the power relation that exists between the doctor and the patient often like are really blurred because of which a lot of patients do seem to believe that they do not have another choice. But like a lot of doctors like to say that, you know, I've got a degree, you've just done a Google search, but we need to ask them the questions back, right? Have you caught up with the recent research? Have you seen what the recent research has said? Have you, do you know about the recent medical trials? We do have the same right, especially because in this private healthcare system that we are in, we are paying these doctors to give us the information that we think we don't have. So they are responsible, but as a patient yourself, there are responsibilities as well because the, the Indian healthcare system being androcentric in its nature is not really protecting its menstruators. So this are, these are the treatment options that are available. And apart from that, uh, some people do take a combination of therapy along with the medicines. And some therapies include CBT, DBT, and some of them just have uh, therapies like group therapies. And some of them even have EDMR. Now, some of these therapies are really complex. So it depends on the counselor who decides whether somebody is ready for a certain therapy or not. Person, but again, you have a personal choice. I do have PMDD and for me, CBT worked for a while, then after that it didn't work. And DBT made things really worse for me and I didn't, I didn't enjoy it. Personally, I think I hated DBT. And another thing is most of the therapy sessions, it involves visualization. They'll ask you to visualize your happy place, visualize this, visualize that. But I do have a lot of trouble visualizing things and because of which a lot of therapies do not work for me. Now, these are some of the things that you need to be active about, reciprocal about, and tell um, your doctor that this is not working for me and this is working for me. Being a self-advocate is so important when you have a chronic disorder. 
because it no one's going to do it for you it becomes your responsibility at one point so being a self advocate and having that power and the agency over your body and over how you want to respond to the chronic illness will be on you and it's really empowering to think of it that way and that can also help you to deal with the everyday difficulties that comes along with a chronic illness then finally uh we i want to discuss about how you can support somebody who has pmdd whether you are a partner whether you are a friend or maybe even a professor or a teacher how can you support somebody who has pmdd or somebody you might suspect have pmdd is a if you suspect that someone has pmdd one of the things that you can actually do is speak to them if you have that sort of relation with relationship with them but if someone actually comes to you or if someone tells you that they have pmdd or they've been diagnosed with pmdd the best thing to do is first read up on it um do not make assumption every single pmdd experience is unique not all of us experience fever in same way and honestly speaking not all of us experienced covid also in one way we've all got various symptoms we've all recovered at various rates so what makes us think that all mental health experiences are same they're not because of which we need to understand that pmdd experiences are all different and they might actually be different from each cycle as well some cycles might be better some cycles might be worse and like i said again medication sometimes it works and sometimes suddenly it stops working so we need to keep all of these things in mind uh when we are talking to someone with pmdd but once again do not accept abuse from somebody just because they have pmdd because as much as the responsibility is on them you also have this right to not be abused someone cannot abuse you and justify it by saying it's because of pmdd i hit you in pmdd rage i yell that you in pmdd rage if they are unable to take responsibility and control it or learn or speak to their doctor psychiatrist therapist when they have all of these things available and they're still not being able to you can you have to be compassionate with them because they're trying their best but at one point it becomes borderline abuse so while you are also caring for someone there's also this fatigue that you experience especially if you're caring for someone who has a chronic illness you also need to remind yourself that you don't have to stay and take care of them you don't have to stay and take the abuse um, and by abuse i mean prolonged abuse not one small outburst that happens once in a while and compassion empathy conversation all of these are really important it's it's like every basic thing between a friendship between a professional relationship that is there it just becomes an additional layer of this conversations and also trying not to be i don't know <laughs> mean about you know people being specific about their cycles because this um disorder is very cyclical and they'll be tracking their cycles their energy levels and all of this is really different so try to be more understanding and patient about somebody tracking their cycle and talking about tracking their cycles and how empowering it is for them to uh sort of put different types of work for different phases of the cycle a lot of people with pmdd they do most of their cleaning shopping everything in their follicular phase and towards the end phase they sort of like to just take a step back and do bare minimum work so it's really really important to understand why they're doing what they're doing across their cycle being supportive and being there is really important but you also need to know when you need to take a step back because you can't take prolonged abuse from somebody who has pmdd because you have responsibility of your own to take care of your own mental health so this is about it about what i have to say about pmdd if you have any questions i will take them uh maybe i'll start off with a question thank you uh, so much for uh, you know sharing this with us i think uh, it was very um simple and very easy to understand for our audiences so thank you um so as a, as a as a medical doctor as an allopathic 
integrative practitioner. I want to hear your thoughts on what can we do um, as a period junction community or um, you know, as this community uh, to empower uh, doctors, um, to, to sensitize them, right? There was a time um, a couple of decades ago where I was doing sensitization workshop with doctors on how to uh, talk to trans people, how to talk to homosexual men and so on, right? So um, what, do you have any thoughts on how we can uh, create this awareness and sensitization among medical professionals? Absolutely. I think one of the first things is that there's also difference in how uh, women doctors perceive something versus how um, you know male or men doctors perceive something. So when I when I go in for um, and explain my PMS symptoms, more often than not, the female doctors are thinking about their own experience of PMS they do not or they might not have actually studied it in their curriculum because I've seen the curriculum. Um, and they might not have studied about it. So they're thinking, okay, it can't be that bad, right? Because I do get PMS too, it can't be that bad. And, and then you have male doctors who probably could be more sensitive because they really don't know the experiences. So they can be on two spectrums because they don't know the experience. They're a little more like, okay, tell me what's happening. Or they can be on the other thing. It's like, oh my God, it's just like, come on. These girls are so sensitive these days. Everything is a thing. Um, and this, this is a spectrum. So I think I really is that there is, it, I think it's not apathy. I think it's just lack of knowledge that is turning or like projecting as apathy. But when there is a knowledge, and if, if I, I'm pretty sure if they've heard, okay, there is something called PMDD, and it means it's like really worse than PMS, and it's re related to suicidal ideation, it's related to higher depression rates, and all of these things, I'm sure equipping them with that knowledge and trying to tell them how can you diagnose this, and what are the treatments available, and what is, you know, you, you know like in medicine, I'm sure everyone, all doctors are aware, like you have the first line of treatment, second line of treatment, and the final line of treatment. So having knowledge of all this can actually empower doctors to diagnose their patients and treat their patients. But now we don't have progressive education. Like doctor graduates in 1950, that's it. He's not picked up a book. Maybe they would have kept in line with other um, advancements and technologies but it's really rare so so i don't know it should be should there be a place where we should have a session on new technologies or every day in icd every year new disorders are being put but how many doctors really do know i have fought with so many doctors because they say pcos is a reproductive disorder if you're going to be that person I cannot come to you and you know take a consultation. You're, the classification itself is completely off and wrong. But I also think a lot of times doctors are like, I know everything. I've seen thousands of patients in my lifestyle. Who are you to come and talk to me? So this ego and this thing, like I think it's just compassion. And actually, you know, like sometimes I think we should just get like a group of patients and make the doctors listen to their experiences because a doctor might have experience of like 100 years, but I as a patient have lived in my body. My experiences as a patient trumps your experiences as a doctor. Uh, so I think it's first step is education, telling them such thing exists. If they don't know, they can't diagnose it. And the second thing is being sensitive about it and not handing out diagnoses. I mean, not handing out diagnosis, not everyone has PMDD. Sometimes it can be that it's a clinical depression and it can be PME. So handing out diagnosis also doesn't help. So there needs to be a clear balance in properly understanding the diagnostic criteria, how to diagnose it. You can't see patient once and be like, okay, you have PMDD. PMDD needs to be uh, you know, evaluated for six months plus in, in its diagnostic criteria. So all of these things are really important so that doctors know that there is PMDD. If I walked into a clinic and I asked the doctor, do you know what PMDD is? There's chances that they might not know it. And I mean, I do want to blame them, but after <laughs> some time, we just understand that doctors are failing patients because the education system is failing the doctors. So it, it needs to be a systemic change. Yeah, no, I think that's very um, clearly put. And I think we have a 
a topic for one of our future sessions where we can bring in uh, doctors who've understood and practitioners who've understood this and share that with other doctors, you know, um, like a continuing medical education kind of a topic. I think this is really important because yeah. diagnosis itself is a big challenge. And personally, yeah. I have experienced this uh, as well, right? So, and until you have the diagnosis, everyone is really confused. Um, and there is a lot of misdiagnosis as well, but just having that clear diagnosis gives so much clarity to everyone involved. Um, and that's a very big step, Absolutely. Um, right? So I think, uh, like rightly said, I think we should look at uh, having a session in the future for medical practitioners to understand PMDD and what it means to um, diagnose and then what are the lines of treatment, what are the options available, not, not just allopathic, but integrative approach, right? Because there's so many other forms that can also help. Great, yeah. Definitely there are like, I mean, studies do show that a lot uh, uh, deficiency in, you know, micronutrients mm -hmm. can make people experience uh, psychological symptoms like mm -hmm. depression. But uh, but just saying that taking micronutrients will be enough would again be a bastardization of understanding this uh, experience or the studies. So sometimes you know this what this what happens is like you see one small study and then you sort of like say as if it's it's the truth, but the sample size, uh, the genetic makeup, the income level. Like, you know, we need to go beyond the biomedical model. We need to understand the psycho, socio, and the medical model. Personally, I think like my PMDD experiences, I was diagnosed and then I had immense support from my parents, my family, my uh, friends. It was really easy. And because I had that social support, it, I felt like ex the PMDD experience really didn't disrupt my life so much. So we need to consider the social support someone has and also the environment they're in. Like you're in a spacious house, you have time for yourself, you can retreat into your bed versus you have to go to work because you will starve otherwise, will impact on how you experience PMDD. Can you work from home during your PMDD week? Or are you a professor who has to go to a class during your PMDD and you have hundreds of students chatting away? Now, these are really, really important things that we often overlook. And I think that's where it really becomes, really like stands out, I think. Yeah. And, and unless you've experienced this yourself or you know someone who you're seeing closely, even to empathize this is you know, so difficult. And I, I, I can yeah. realize that, I can relate to that um, right before I knew someone, um, how it was and then after, after that, after the diagnosis, what it meant. So I think um, empathy is one thing, but to even have that understanding is so difficult in this space, right? Because it's so um, different yeah. in some ways. But anyway, I will hold there and see if there are any other yeah. questions from anyone else. Please feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question or type it in the chat window if you like. question here on the message asking if there is any um, support groups that you are aware of uh, for um, family. So we do run a PMDD support group. One support group is for people who have PMDD and the other support group is for people, uh, parents or partners or friends who are living close contact with the person who has PMDDs and how they can support them. Can you share a link or any some, such information about the um, support group? You can, uh, you can reach out to us on Instagram. There's a link on our bio. Oh. Um, I have a question that um, a registrant submitted on um, upon registration. I think um, people are curious how to manage um, whether it's PMDD or PME or PMS, how do you manage um, kind of emotional fluctuations throughout um, the menstrual cycle? Um, you know, ways to manage th these fluctuations and emotions that um, can enable somebody to live, you know, their life and um, at work peacefully. Do you have any suggestions for that? 
So first thing I want to point out is that, you know, everyone has different experiences and some cycles are better than other cycles. So first thing is always appreciating your progress and not looking at perfection. And when it comes to regulating emotions or, you know, all of this, we have not learned them as children. Like more or less what happens is like in some families when a child starts crying because their parent hits them, they'll be like, you don't stop crying, I'll hit you again. So we have learned very bad uh, emotional and psychological regulations. Now, this is where therapy helps. They'll help you understand and they'll help you develop really good uh, behaviors to regulate yourself. Sometimes you learn them as you grow up. Sometimes you learn your personal experiences, but sometimes someone has to teach you how to emotionally regulate yourself. And that's really no shame in that because if somebody has to teach you calculus, there is no shame in going to a therapist and learning how to self-regulate your behavior, self-regulate your emotions. But while I'm still seeing this, again, because of the interactions and the biological processes that involve in PMDD or any mental health disorder, they can be, it can be a very huge and significant effort. So it's also important and there should be no guilt or shame in popping pills. Because when you have fever, you're taking a paracetamol. Now, when you have depression, you need more neurotransmitters. You need more dopamine. You are taking a pill. There's nothing wrong with that. You are taking calcium pills because you think you're not getting enough calcium in the food. You're taking iron pills. So there's absolutely no shame in getting a little bit of happiness and a little bit of stability from pills. Saying anything beyond this by saying have a routine, exercise and yoga, I think would just be redundant because it doesn't help everyone. And it just be patronizing. So I would say is just learn self-regulating behavior. Uh, try to track your uh, emotions and your experiences and how you react with them. Uh, instead of reacting, take a minute and think back and sort of try to respond. And it's absolutely okay to have outbursts because we are all human. With or without PMDD, everybody has outbursts and that's just part of being human. Um, I don't think psychologists can ask, uh, in India, uh, can ask uh, patients to get a thyroid test or a hormonal test, but uh, you can refer them to a gynecologist and tell them to get their thyroid and hormonal tests done because they can have an impact on their psychological health as well. Because uh, in, even I don't think psychologists in India can also prescribe medication because of which they can't ask for diagnostic tests as well. Yeah, absolutely. Also, um, the point that you make um, that, you know, it's important to have, you know, be your own advocate, be your own patient advocate is so true, even for basic hormonal tests I've experienced like incredible challenges even getting basic hormone tests just to see where I'm at in the United States you know and in India both places so across the board the understanding of um like hormonal function and uh you know testing women to see you know where their hormones are at and uh is 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 very like under under tapped into so Thank you for, for bringing that point. Another thing is like, if there's a, do if you go to a doctor and the doctor tells you that, you know, what's all in your head, you don't need a transvaginal ultrasound. You don't need an ultrasound. You don't need a blood test or you don't need this medication. Just ask them to put it down in their prescription and see how many of them are willing to write saying that I've advised them not to take an ultrasound. I've advised them not to take this. No doctor will do that and they will instead write a test for you. Ask them to write it down on the prescription pad and give it to you. No one will do that. Because if something happens, it's on head and people pay a lot of fees to protect themselves from malpractice. There are a lot of doctors in India do have malpractice um, insurance, insurance if I'm not wrong. Yeah. yeah, so ask them to write it down and see how much they're willing to pay for it. No doctor will write it down. So if someone rejects a, a medication, they reject a test, they reject something, just ask them to clearly write it down. They will not, and they, instead you'll get the test.
I have one other um, submitted question that um, we can post. Um, mm -hmm. People are curious about how to educate people um, in work and in life about the impact of menstrual and mental health without um, feeling vulnerable and vain, like how to bring more comfortability and ease to having these discussions um, colloquially. I think uh, this is again date back to the conversations of you know second wave of feminism. We are in the fourth wave of feminism. In the second wave of feminism, what happened is that women were like, we should not separate ourselves from men. And by doing that, we are at a disadvantage. So they second wave of feminists were the ones who advocated against PMS, against PMDD, because they thought by talking about this, they would um, not let women hold positions of power. And this sort of seeped into uh, the already misogynistic and sexist uh, medical education or medicine that was existing. And now at this point of time, even when we talk about period leave, even when we talk about period leave, why does it get such pushback is because we're calling it period leave. Do we just need period leave because I'm on period? No. But why can't we, I think we just need to put a spin on it. Why can't we call it reasonable adjustments? We have disability law in India. Reasonable adjustments at workplace for somebody who has diagnosed a PMDD, diagnosed a primary dysmenorrhea, which is period pain. Therefore, when we're talking about this, we are not pathologizing the entire menstruation or the entire menstrual experience. We are pathologizing what needs to be, that is this particular disorders, whether it is endometriosis, adenomyosis, primary dysmenorrhea, uterine fibroids, PMDD, whatever it is, we are talking about these disorders and people with these disorders and not all women. So instead of calling it period leave and making it making the subtle differences in uh, biological responses as such a big thing, why can't we look at it at a more health point of view and look at it in terms of reasonable adjustments? I think this is the best way to approach it when you, when you talk about it in workplace. Because as somebody with an existing chronic illness, based on the disability laws that we have in India, you are entitled for reasonable adjustment. And you talk about menstrual and mental health in terms of PMDD, in terms of PMDD, depression, anything in terms of reasonable adjustments. Instead of making it a gender issue, make it an issue of health and look at it as reasonable adjustments to a certain disorder, not to periods, not to menstrual cycle, but to PMDD, if that makes any sense. I think that's a very, very valid point that you bring in, which actually uh, in a way, broadly, by generalizing, disempowers the entire menstruating community. Right? Yeah. So I think this is very important, even when we're talking about policy changes and we're looking at advocacy, the language that we should use is exactly on these lines. So I think that's a very valid point. Thank you for bringing that out. Um, because a lot of people are unsure. I mean, the intent may be good, but they don't have clarity on what to push for. And that Absolutely. leads to further disempowerment in some ways. Because when we talk about endometriosis, like when I was in the UK, people with endometriosis got it recognized as a disability because of which they got reasonable adjustment at workplace. Now, again, what is reasonable adjustment? Now, for a multi-million dollar company, giving you a wheelchair is reasonable adjustment. But for a really small company to make their entire um, workplace wheelchair reasonable adjustment to that company, because it costs them a lot. Now, again, this classification really helps because it differentiates between our formal and informal economy and what reasonable adjustment means depending upon the kind of place that we are working for. Tessie had raised her hand. I don't know if uh, she had a question or that was um, just by mistake. We're just waiting to see if anybody had any um, further questions. I feel we could go on and on to learn more about this topic. And uh, yeah, there's so much to learn. 
um, from this. And um, maybe you can give a shout out um, for any resources that you have cultivated on Beyond Blood that people can go to to find more information about this and um, maybe even incorporate this into their own uh, menstrual health work. So um, one of the best resources would be to go to uh, IAPMD. It's, it's www.iapmd.org. They have a lot of resources and they also have a lot of FAQs that answer most questions about PMDD. They also regularly give out, give out in simple words about the recent research and clinical trials that are coming about on PMDD in terms of medication. And most importantly, it's a volunteer organization and they also have a clinical board where they're conducting their own studies as well. But not in terms of pharmaceuticals, but in terms of understanding PMDD in terms of its uh, uh, in genetics and th of, of sorts. And there's also a app, it's called Me versus PMDD. It's available on both iOS and Android. And now this app helps you track all symptoms. It has over 150 symptoms that you can choose from, track them throughout your cycle and see what are your experiences. And this way you can even show your doctor and you can actually see how and what kind of medication works. For example, for some people like myself, um, I can't sleep well in my premenstrual phase, which ends up making me really tired. Now, the idea is that I am not tired because I'm just experiencing fatigue because of PMDD. I'm tired because I'm not able to sleep well because of PMDD. Now, what do I need to fix? I need to fix my sleep. But if I'm tired just because I'm tired, then that's a different case. Now, having these symptoms in hand can really personalize your treatment and your experiences and how you can improve your quality of life. But one thing that we always need to remember is that with any chronic illness, it's always about improving your quality of life. It's not about curing it. It's about improving your quality of life. If you're looking for a cure, you're just going to waste your money, your time, your mental peace, and probably make it worse in, <laughs> in a quest to find a cure, uh, a cure. So please always remember it's progress, not perfection. It's quality of life, not cure. I think that's very well said. And that kind of brings us to towards the close. Autumn, um, anything that you want to add and then close the session? Before. Yeah, thank you so much, Anuya. There have been so many amazing insights um, in this discussion. And I, I really look forward to um, encouraging other people from the period junction and outside the period junction to uh, listen to this recording or the Facebook Live. Um, because they will be sure to learn a lot. So thank you so much. Um, and uh, yeah, we look forward to staying in, in connection um, with you in, in the work going forward. Thank you so much for having me. It was really great discussions that we had today. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Yes. Yeah. That, Enjoy your evening. Bye-bye. <laughs> Take care.